Well, what are you doing here? Oh, I know why you're here. You're here because this is the Saturday Night Libertarian Conversation, and that's why you're here. Well, I am glad you're here. And just about any subject is fair game, but I'm going to start us off with something that's uh, in the news right now. I was just looking at the news on the various news websites, Fox News, uh, CNN, New York Times, L.A. Times, Washington Post, see what was, has been going on this weekend. And the Saudis uh, had more of their municipal elections. I guess they had them divided up over a month uh, apart or something. Maybe these were the runoffs or whatever. But that was in the news, again, that they're having city elections in various parts of the country. And a big thing was made about that a month or so ago that, gee, even the Saudis are feeling the pressure of the Bush administration's foreign policy of bringing democracy to the Middle East. And, of course, we know that Iraq had its elections in January. Of course, it's now three months since the elections, and they have not conducted any business whatsoever in the new parliament. They have not been able to agree on an organization of the parliament, but who's going to quibble about that? And then, of course, the Syrian Lebanon situation that was so big a month ago, getting the Syrians out of Lebanon, and according to a Syrian spokesman, the final Syrian troops will leave tomorrow, and all the Syrians will be out of Lebanon. And isn't that wonderful? And now Lebanon will be a free country. Gee, thanks once again to Bush. And, you know, uh, when was it, a year or so ago that uh, Libya said it was going to give up its atomic energy uh, development, its nuclear weapons development, and all of that sort of thing? Uh, and that, that was all attributed to George Bush's pressure. I'm not really sure how that was supposed to come about. But here we have one thing after another. Now, let's just suppose for a moment that we are going to accept all of this at face value. If you listen to this show, you know that I don't accept any of these things at face value. And I kind of doubt that you do, too. Otherwise, you would be complacently doing something else with your time rather than listening to talk radio, trying to get a new insight or a new slant on things, not just on this broadcast, but on anybody's broadcast on talk radio. But let's just suppose we take all this at face value. Suppose George Bush has really caused some of these countries, governments, to change their tune for the moment about these things and try to bring democracy to the Middle East, and so on. I still have to say, so what? The moment our government, our military, our officials, our president turns this back, they're going to be back to doing what they were doing before. You don't really think the Saudi royal family is planning to turn over power to whoever might get elected in a national election in Saudi Arabia? Do you think the Kuwait ruling family, for which George Bush Sr. took Americans into war and saw thousands of people killed, do you think, the Kuwait ruling family, is going to suddenly abdicate and let Kuwait become a democracy? Do you think that Syria is suddenly going to boot its king out, or Jordan boot its king out, or Egypt? Uh, in Egypt, is Hosea Mubarak suddenly going to relinquish power? He said, oh, that was another one of Bush's great victories, that he was going to let somebody run elect against him in the election that's coming up in the next year. But... <laughs> I kind of think that a year or two from now, Mubarak will still be the head of state in Egypt. The point is that the only possible way that democracy is going to come to these countries in any working way, in any practical way, is if the American military goes in there and uproots the prevailing government. It's the only possible way, unless the United States uses force, unless the United States is prepared to kill another group of tens of thousands of people, as they did in Iraq, and sacrifice another 1,500, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 U.S. soldiers, and we don't know how many will be killed in Iraq by the time that's over with. Force is not the answer, and yet force is the only way that George Bush is going to get what he wants. The only way that it can be done is to uproot these ruling families by force, and even then, it is not going to bring democracy. Do you think that Iraq is going to be a working, functioning democracy like the Canadian parliament that you see on C-SPAN? I really don't think so. I don't think there is a chance of it. I believe that as soon as our military leaves, and there are only advisors left, or maybe a few uh, marine companies at a military base somewhere in Iraq, Iraq will probably descend into all-out civil war between the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shiites. Do you think any one of those three groups is going to be, agree to be ruled by another? Because these feelings are very, very strong. If the Shiites take power, they're going to use that power to impose their way on the Sunnis or the Kurds. The Sunnis will do the same thing as they did for years and years. Once again, I have to say, force is not the answer. It's not the answer in domestic policy either. Force has never brought about any lasting benefit anywhere. And don't tell me that the United States government using force in World War II was somehow beneficial to the world. The United States was never threatened with attack by Germany. 
The Germans couldn't even cross the English Channel to invade England, let alone cross the Atlantic Ocean to invade the United States. And when the United States entered the war and did everything it could to help the Soviet Union, it left Europe half free and half slave. And when it left Asia at the end of the Asian War against Japan, it left China ripe to be taken over by the communists there. Force did not bring freedom in World War II. Force is not bringing freedom to the Middle East. Force is not going to bring a higher standard of living to people in the United States. You know, I really believe that our quarrel is not with the Republicans, it's not with the Democrats, it's not with George Bush, it is not with this program or that program. Our quarrel is with the use of force, that our enemy is force. The idea that force can solve problems, because force doesn't solve problems, it always leads to unintended consequences, because when you force somebody to do something, that person doesn't stay put. If you force a country to do something, that country doesn't stay put. It will only stay put as long as you continue to use force. And the more things that you get yourself into, the more force has to be used. Just look at what we now have on a national scale. All these programs have to be enforced by force. That's what enforced means. And as a result, we have an enormous, enormous federal bureaucracy. We have enormous federal law enforcement. We have enormous state and local law enforcement, far, far, far beyond anything, many times the size of what these agencies were 40 or 50 years ago. All there to enforce all of these laws, all of these regulations. And as I've said before, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that is beyond the realm, beyond the purview, beyond the limits of what the federal government will get itself into, what politicians will legislate about, what regulatory agencies will get us into. We saw in the Martha, Martha Stewart case that she was convicted for lying about something that isn't even a crime. And in fact, they pretty much made up a law just for the occasion, lying to a federal official, even though she wasn't under oath when she supposedly lied, even though in the courtroom they couldn't even prove that she lied. But the point is that it was just one more step into an area that followed logically from all the steps before, and now they have to enforce all this to absolutely make sure that no one ever lies to a federal official before. The federal officials, of course, can lie as much as they want to the citizens. But my point is that once you go down the road of force, it just goes on endlessly. There is no end to the road. And so now we find senators holding hearings about steroids and baseball. Where in the Constitution does the federal government have any jurisdiction, any authority whatsoever regarding drugs of any kind? let alone baseball. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. Baseball wasn't invented until after the Constitution was written, so how could the Founding Fathers have anticipated that? Obviously, it's important that the legislators and the judges step into that area on their own because it's something the Founding Fathers couldn't anticipate. Anyway, you get my point. Now let's look at the other side, though. If we don't use force to get what we want in the world, what do we use? Well, what do you use when you have a disagreement with your wife and she doesn't want to do or your husband excuse me for being so sexist if you have a disagreement with your spouse or your spouse just simply doesn't see something what do you do you try to persuade your spouse you try to show logically one thing after another why your point of view is correct and sometimes you succeed now what happens then do you have to watch over your spouse every moment to make sure that there is no fallback no relapse into the previous position no you have won a convert to your position, and you no longer have to do anything about it. You don't have to carry a gun in the house. You don't have to have a posse ready to track down anybody in the house who has slipped out from under your thumb. This is the way progress takes place in human relationships, all human relationships, and at the family level, at the national level, that through persuasion, one point of view prevails, and then nothing further has to be done about it let alone the fact that in the free market you don't even have to persuade other people to your point of view you just simply do what you want to do with people who want to do it with you and other people who don't want to do that or don't see it that way they go to their church or they go to their store or they go to their club whatever it may be no force is necessary everybody just simply minds his own business and does what he wants to do but once you try to use force to solve these things or once you try to vote on them and then enforce the outcome by force what you have then is everybody herded into the same corral. And that's when we become like sheep, like cattle. God, every time I go through the security checkpoints at the airports, I feel like cattle. The Fort Lauderdale Airport, which I have to fly to every other week for my TV show for Free Market News Network, has the 
line set up to go through the security checkpoint in one of those mazes, and there's always a long line, and you get the feeling that that's exactly what you are. You're like cattle being herded through this little maze. Uh, this First you go to the right, then you go to the left, and then the right, and so forth, until you get to the security checkpoint, where you are then required to take off your jacket, take off your shoes, empty your pockets, and hope that you don't set off the beeper when you go through the metal detector, because if you set off the beeper, then you will find that you haven't yet been humiliated enough. You now have to be patted down. You now have to sit down and raise your feet up one at a time so that the security guard can run his little scanner over your leg. And God only knows what's going to happen to you. But that's what happens once we organize society by force. And you can see the end result of this, if you want to, by reading a book like 1984 by George Orwell that just simply shows where America might be 20 or 30 years from now, or maybe even sooner, just simply following the trend we're on now of organizing everything in society by force instead of by voluntary relationships. Uh, force just simply does not achieve anything. You can subjugate people with force. You can put people in prison. You can put, lock them up in cells. And you can dominate another country as the Ottoman Empire dominated the Middle East for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then the British and the French dominated the Middle East from the end of World War I until after World War II. And you can dominate uh, any country if you have superior power in your country, just as George Bush intends to do, as George Bush has done with Iraq. But it doesn't change people's minds. And to get a little bit saccharine about it, it doesn't change their hearts. All they're doing is waiting for the opportunity to get rid of you. All they're doing is waiting till the op for the opportunity to slip out from under your thumb. And that's what happens when you change laws, great laws, to try to change people in the United States. When you pass a law to tell people they can no longer do this or that, then what they do is try to figure out how to circumvent the law. Look at all the effect that the laws against drugs have had, had, in, have had in this country. Just look at how it has stamped out marijuana and cocaine and heroin. And if you don't think it's stamped them out, every week you can find somewhere in some news site on the web that some drug bust has taken place somewhere and they've captured $10 million worth of heroin or $5 million worth of cocaine or whatever it may be. So, gee, we must be winning these wars by using force. But it doesn't work. Now we have organized the healthcare system by force. Over 50% of all of the dollars spent on healthcare in America pass through governments. And another 25% are spent by companies who are doing it only because the tax laws make it advantageous for them to do so. And the result of having all of this now organized by force is that we have continual reports of Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud. We have continual situations where doctors are trying to circumvent the regulations in order to treat their clients in the way that they think that they should be treated. And what we have, of course, are as a result of all of the consequences of force is that we have medic medical care costs that are just running sky high compared to what they were 40 or 50 years ago. So that while new technology is bringing the price of computers and electronics products and so many other things down, the cost of medical care is going up. It seems that wherever force is being used by government in order to make something happen, prices are rising, as in healthcare, as in education, which gets more and more expensive every year, whether we're talking about colleges, public and private, or we're talking about the government elementary and high school systems, or whether we're talking about the oil price, which is so dependent upon military activity in the Middle East. Wherever force is being used, prices are going up and up and up and up. And where force is not being used, where the free market is dominating and consensual voluntary activity is the norm, as with computers or electronic products, prices are falling at an unbelievable rate. When you stop and think that the price of a computer, given the power that it has and the speed that it has and the capacity that it has, that the price of a computer is not down 10 or 15 percent from where it was 25 years ago. The price of a computer today is less than 1 percent of what it was 25 years ago. I put $100,000 into my computer system from 1978 until the mid-80s. $100,000. A year and a half ago, I bought a computer for $1,500. That's 1.5% of what I spent 25 years ago. But the computer that I bought 18 months ago is many, many, many times as powerful, so much faster than the computer I had 25 years ago that it's almost impossible to measure the difference between them. Compared to the other one, this, it's as though everything is instantaneous on the computer I have now. And the storage capacity is just 
uh, let me think here a second, it's over a thousand times as great. And yet it costs one and a half percent of what it cost 25 years ago. Can you imagine if we could apply that same sort of, of ingenuity and entrepreneurship and innovation to healthcare? Do you think, can you imagine the diseases that might get cured? Can you imagine the ease with which you could take care of your worst aches and pains or even the smallest aches and pains, which now are not worth treating because it's too expensive to do something about it unless you're covered by insurance, in which case you're helping to run up the, the cost of it. Can you imagine if education were organized on the same basis? So I come back to where I started. Our enemy is not the Republicans or the Democrats or the Socialists or the Communists or the Muslims. Our enemy is the use of force by anyone at any time in any place except to defend oneself. And when I say by defend oneself, I don't mean thinking that somebody on the other side of the ocean might have developed some weapons that might be able to reach this country, that might be accompanied by an intention to do so, that might just possibly be some kind of a threat at some time in the future in some kind of way. I mean defending this country only if it is invaded. I mean defending your house only if it is invaded. I mean not using force for any purpose except to ward off an attacker. If we could get force out of our lives, to get the initiation of force to be the only crime in America. My God, what a civilization we would have. And let's now look at the emails that uh, have come in. Uh, one of them from someone, and this just might be an alias, but his name is Red Sugar. And he says about force, is it good that the Environmental Protection Agency could force us to clean up the air? Could the AP EPA actually help us, or is it just another governmental agency? Good for nothing would be more accurate. Consider the following. The May 2005 Consumer Reports magazine uses EPA statistics that show that ozone can cause ill health, that the ozone-type air purifiers are not worth the cost, that people die from too much ozone. Does anyone have anything to offer to defend air purifiers, such as the Sharper Image air purifier? I, for one, think that Consumer Reports magazine is all wet in thinking that ozone is a problem, that Sharper Image is a poor air purifier. You guessed it, we purchased several ozone-type sharper image air purifiers. I like the product. I like cleaning the sludge every two weeks. Sludge, some of which does not get to my lungs. Help, is Consumer Reports and the EPA correct? Well, I must admit, Red Sugar, that I'm not quite sure I understand what you're getting at here, uh, but maybe somebody can call in. Maybe you can call in and clarify it for me. But let's just talk about the EPA. The EPA is a government agency, and as such, it is a political agency. That means that everything that the EPA does is going to be decided by politics, from the laws that govern the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and the laws that it is supposed to enforce to the specific regulations that the EPA imposes on its own. Now consider the following. The air is not clean, and there are problems with it. There are smog, there are things like this. And there are some parts of the country that have very bad air, like Los Angeles or Houston and some other places, and there are parts of the country where the air is just clean and wonderful and great, Seattle being an example. Another good example is Tennessee, which is a place where I happen to live. The air is very clean and pure here, and it's one of the benefits of living here. But suppose that people who are upset about the dirty air in Los Angeles go to Washington and get a law passed, a law that will require all new factories to have some kind of very, very expensive equipment to make sure that the factory is not emitting terrible particles into the air that's going to make the air dirty and cause smog. Wonderful idea. Gosh, let's get behind this. Let's write our congressmen and support this law. Well, you won't read the law. You won't read the bill before it is passed. The people who are telling you to support this will not read the bill. If they did, they might notice that in order not to create too great a hardship on companies already in existence who would have to spend tons of money to re uh, what do they call it, retrofit their entire factories to comply with this new law, they will exempt existing factories from this law, but require new factories to have it. So a new factory is built in Tennessee, where there is no smog problem, but it will have to spend extra money on all of this new equipment to comply with the new law that the EPA is going to enforce. Meanwhile, the competitor of this Tennessee company out in Los Angeles, where the smog is a real problem, will not have to spend the money to comply with this law. So what has happened by the passage of this law is not that the air any place has been made cleaner than it was before, but that a company in Los Angeles has done something to make it harder for other companies to come into existence and compete with it. In other words, the practical effect of the law has nothing to do with the air whatsoever, but does have to do with one company using the force of government to make sure that competitors don't enter its field and push it out of business. 
That's the way politics works. Now, how could such a bill get passed in the first place? Who profits by passing such a bill? Well, the congressmen and senators, many of them will profit from it because of the support that the L.A. company will give them. The support may be in campaign donations. The support may be in promises of lucrative jobs that senators or congressmen can get when they retire from Congress. It may be in many, many different ways. But any time you turn something over to the government, you transform it from a medical, scientific, financial, military issue, whatever it was before, it is now a political issue to be decided by whoever has the most political influence, and that will never be you or I. Why do we have a federal EPA? Shouldn't this be a matter for each state to decide if there ever was an issue in which federalism seemed to be very important. By federalism, I'm meaning a federation of states rather than a national government imposing one way on everybody. I mean, every state has a different kind of, of environmental problem to be concerned with. How in the world can you pass a law that's going to apply equally and be enforced equally against 50 different states that have 50 different problems? Well, the reason you do have such a national agency and the reason you do have national laws is because it is to the advantage of the lawmakers to have that kind of power. And this brings us to a very important principle about force. And that is, once you condone the use of force, then who is going to make sure that the force is not misused? No one. Because somebody is going to be dominant. Somebody is going to be supreme. And that person can use the force any way he wants to. So the lawmakers who have control of the force just simply use the force to expand their powers. They use the force to make sure that they have control over more areas of your life. Control at the federal level over more state governments. Control at the state government over more local government. More control over local governments. The local governments, more control over the people. And so the force just keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. It is the principal reason that government grows. is because the force is in the hands of the people who legislate to make government grow. And there is no reason to think that all this force that we have was demanded by the people, that the people just absolutely could not live without it. As envious as people are, as avaricious as people are, they have not been demanding that the government use force to give them more things, even though that is the common assumption. In fact, I have another email here that goes into that. But the fact of the matter is that once the force is in the hands of somebody, whether they were people who inherited their positions as part of a monarchy, or whether they were elected by the people, or whether they seized the control of the government by force, however they got the force in their hands. Once it's in their hands, they are the ones that make the rules, and there's nothing you can do about it. And of course, then the force will be misused, and it will not go to any of the things that it's being touted as being used for. That's why government programs always turn out to be different from what they were intended. And Michael uh, did email me. He says, not paying income tax could might be a great retirement option, given the current economics and talk of, or the current economy and talk of social security, free medical care, and free meals a day. TV workout room and a lot of federal facilities have great law library access. I'm not sure I understand all that. I kind of think he's talking about going to prison. It might be a great retirement option given the current economy. Talk of social security, free medical care, and three meals a day. A TV workout room and a lot of federal facilities have great law library access. But he then gets the question, what is the difference between anarchy and what you call the free market? And... That's a very good question. What is the difference? The anarchy literally means an absence of rule. A before something usually means the opposite of what it is. In other words, amorality is an absence of morality. And atypical means something that is not typical. And arch, A-R-C-H, is, um, or A-R-C-H-Y, archy, is a suffix meaning rule. Monarchy, a rule by one person. Uh, democracy, rule by the people, demos being the Greek word for people, and uh, autarky meaning self-rule. So anarchy means an absence of rule. And what it means literally um, is an absence of rule, but what it means figuratively throughout history has been an absence of government, an absence of laws, an absence of the use of force to settle problems. Now, how does this differ from the free market? It doesn't. The free market is really, truly an anarchy. It is a place where everybody decides for himself what he wants to do, but has no ability to rule other people's lives by excluding choices for other people or forcing choices upon other people. So the free market itself is an anarchy. The question that comes up, is there something that we need to envelop the free market in, something meaning government, where the initiation of force is necessary? And... Uh, it's a question that we really don't need to answer today because we are so far away from even 
in any way, that being a relevant question, that we don't really need to answer it. And there are so many more important questions that need to be answered. But as I've said before, if we ever get the government down to its constitutional size, the federal government, then we can think about ways that we can alter the Constitution to make government even smaller and to get government out of more areas of our lives. And when government gets very, very, very small, it's going to be to the advantage of some people to think of ways to do things without government and to make a profit by selling those ways to other people. Uh, we already see this in some ways with gated communities and watchdogs and burglar alarm systems and guns and so forth as ways of protecting one's property because we know the police are not going to protect our property. All they're going to do is to write up a police report if something is stolen and then file it away and that really doesn't get your property back and you didn't want to lose it in the first place so you took steps to make sure that nobody entered your home and took your property as one example. But those things would become much more prevalent if government got down to a very small size. It wouldn't be so much the individual technical ways of doing these things, but rather suggestions for ways of circumventing government entirely and doing things in the free market that we are accustomed to thinking that government must do. I can imagine ways that we could have a complete free market, a complete anarchy, with no government whatsoever. But again, they are irrelevant because we're nowhere close to such a thing. And the question is, how can we get government down to a size that is a small fraction of what it is today? If we got government back to the size that it was, say, in 1950, I probably would quit writing articles. I'd probably quit worrying about a lot of these things, and I'd spend a lot more time listening to music and try to find some people to play poker with and go on cruises with my wife and do other things that would be a lot more fun than sitting at the computer writing <laughs> articles and being cranky uh, simply because it would be so much better than it is now, even though 1950 would not be ideal. I can remember, not in 1950, but in 1960, swearing and cussing at the enormous size of the federal government and all the terrible things that it was doing and involved in and so forth and so on. It was 45 years ago, and the size of the federal government was about $80 billion, about, what is that, one-thirtieth of the size that it is now, and I thought it was way too big, but I would gladly take it back now. So, anyway, the only reason to think about a complete free market with no use of force, no initiation of force whatsoever, is simply as a mental exercise, because otherwise it's not relevant right now. Michael also asked the question, how do you stop runaway global corporations? Well, I don't even know what a runaway global corporation is, because what defines a runaway glo global corporation? Somebody that's making too much money? Somebody that's uh, outsourcing and uh, hiring people in Thailand or Indonesia or someplace for much less money than they would have to pay Americans to do the same job? Well, I don't consider any of those things to be wrong. Now, if you're talking about a corporation that is using force to make people work for it, in other words, slavery, or is using force to keep other companies out of the market the way drug dealers do, then you've got a real problem, and you need to do something to stop that initiation of force. But I don't think that's what Michael's talking about. I think Michael may just simply be reacting to the political verbiage that goes on about outsourcing and things of that sort. There is no reason that we need to stop at the borders of this country and say that it's fine if the job is in this country, but it's bad if the job is in Mexico or India or someplace else. Uh, we want to take advantage of everything that's available in this world. I don't want to be deprived of French wines. I don't want to be deprived of Italian shoes. I don't want to be deprived of European opera. I don't want to be a, uh, deprived of anything that's available in this world. If somebody's willing to sell it and I want to buy it, no one should get in our way. An article appeared on the Ludwig von Mises Institute website last August, uh, eight months ago, and it has to do with two things we've been discussing tonight. One, the question that just came in about uh, runaway global corporations. Uh, we have been inundated the last few years with stories about scandals of uh, terrible accounting, uh, uh, cheating, cooking the books, as President Bush has said over and over and over again, uh, about WorldCom and Enron and other companies and these terrible people like Ken Lay, the head of, of Enron and so forth. And not one person in 100,000 actually knows what went on in any of these companies. All they know is uh, what's appeared in the press, which is mostly just a rehashing of government prosecutor press releases. And can you imagine 12 people on a jury picked in Houston or someplace else who know nothing about corporate finance are supposed to decide whether a corporate CEO or chief financial officer has broken the law in the way he kept the books on the company, whether the profits were inflated in order to make the stock go up or the profits were deflated in order to make the tax burden less or whatever it may be. In any event, this article 
is entitled, Is Ken Lay a Criminal? And it's by Professor William L. Anderson and Candace E. Jackson. And it's a lengthy article, but a very interesting one. And at the next break, I will put it up on the Radio Links page, so that if you just go to my website, harrybrown.org, right at the top of the homepage, click on Radio Links, and you will see this article is Ken Lay a Criminal. What you'll see is a link to this article, and you can read it at your leisure. But I want to hit the highlights here. And it's uh, a little ways into the article. It says, Before tackling the merits or demerits of the government's case against Lay, there are a few things the reader should know. The first is that although Lay may not be guilty of the crimes with which the government has charged him, someone involved with the case has committed a felony. It is against the law to leak grand jury testimony or procedures to the press, including information that a sealed indictment has been issued. In other words, just the fact that an indictment has been issued without even mentioning the contents of that indictment, but of course it's doubly wrong if you issue uh, uh, somehow let information leak about the contents of that indictment. And the writers go on to say, this is ironic. Most of the nation's newspapers have been enthusiastic about the indictment of Lay, yet whoever received secret information about the indictment and subsequently published it aided and abetted a felony. Given the history of the conduct of federal prosecutors in high-profile, white-collar cases, however, it is almost certain that the felony leak came from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Houston where the indictment took place. Thus, federal prosecutors are unencumbered with the burden of legal penalties when they commit actual crimes, as opposed to the many of the make-believe derivative crimes with which business executives are charged. That should give everyone pause as to the ethical boundaries or lack of them that bind these public servants as they go about the government's business of increasing the nation's prison population. Now, let me interrupt there. This goes back to what I was saying in the first hour, that once the force, the ability to use force, to initiate force, is in the hands of these people in the government, then they are above the law. They can do whatever they want. They can bend the law. They can do anything. And they never have to suffer consequences for it. Politicians can vote to go to war. And hundreds of thousands of people might die eventually. And someday it may turn out that it was all for naught. As uh, Howard Zinn, I believe it was, said, said in the First World War, uh, I forget the figure, but it's in the tens of millions of people that died. And not one person has ever been able to advance a single reason that the war was worth the loss of one human life. And yet not one of the politicians that voted to send America into that catastrophe ever had to pay a consequence of any kind whatsoever for causing so many deaths, a 100,000 deaths of Americans alone. And yet nobody had to pay a price for it. And here, as these writers, Anderson and Jackson, are pointing out, federal prosecutors can break the law all the time. They can leak information that is where it is absolutely against the law to leak information. They can do it, and they never pay a price for it. They can lie to the public and they never pay a price for it. They can do anything they want, and they never pay a price for it. The they go on to say, the prosecutor as hero theme reverberates in the media. Here is a quote from the July 19, 2004 edition of U.S. News, which is typical of the state-worshipping press in the wake of the lay indictments. Quote, the federal prosecutors mopping up after corporate scandals can remember the summer of 2004 as their season of sweet victory. Last week, a jury convicted Adelphia communications founder John Regas and his son Timothy Regas of conspiracy, bank fraud, and securities fraud. A judge denied Martha Stewart's bid for a retrial and will deliver her sentence next week. And charges finally reached the top in the biggest case of all when a grand jury indicted former Enron CEO Kenneth Lay on 11 criminal counts, including bank fraud, securities fraud, and making misleading, misleading statements. End of quote. Then the writers go on to say, One would remind people that the supposed pursuit of justice is not a game in which we have a victory. These are legal procedures that destroy families, incarcerate talented people, and eviscerate legitimate business firms. Apparently so that U.S. attorneys can bask in the glory that only the news media can provide. Then, he, then they go on later in the article to talk about the um, actual charges against Kenneth Lay. He was the chairman of Enron and became the poster boy for corporate fraud and the need for the government to clamp down on corporations and the whole works and the subject of endless jokes by Jay Leno and David Letterman and any other uh, comic who wanted a cheap shot. Bill in Arkansas says, what kind of test heads does GlideWrite sell? I listen to your show every Saturday, well, almost, and would like to support your sponsor. But their commercial doesn't shed much light on what they sell. Well, if it was something that you could use, you would have recognized it right away. But it is they make test heads that hard disk manufacturers and other manufacturers of computer memory products can use to test to make sure that the disks are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. And it's one of those things that the free market does, where one company produces... Uh, something and some other company produces the equipment by which you can make absolutely sure that the product of the first company is doing what it's supposed to do. And Glide Ride uh, 
produces those and they advertise in this show uh, in hopes, of course, that there are people listening to this show who are in a position to use those test heads. But, Bill, if you don't know what they are, then I, I don't think you ought to try to buy them. <laughs> uh, Jerry says, uh, I think a worthwhile government program is the Transportation Security Agency. They've been there since 9-11, and so far no more hijacked airplanes. Well, you know, that's interesting, because before 9-11, they were telling us that the procedures put in place, which we have had for many, many years, going back into the 70s, had not produced a hijacking yet. Actually, it had produced some hijackings before, but none as bad as 9-11. And it's the same sort of thing that after the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, uh, certain procedures were put in place, and everybody said, well, everybody in the government said, okay, see, we can fix it now because it's been years, and there's been no further trouble. But then along came 9-11, and boom, there was lots of trouble. So you can't really say that we have done away with terrorism in the United States. They keep telling us about all of these threats, and you know that if there are thousands and thousands of threats, which is really what you have to conclude from all the press releases that come out, they couldn't possibly have gotten every single one of the thousands of them, so there are others lurking out there. Plus, it's interesting, too, on a broader scale, uh, I don't have the numbers right on the tip of my tongue, but there were considerably more terrorist attacks around the world in 2004 than there were in 2003. So when George Bush says the world is a safer place with Saddam Hussein going, gone, it's just another example of how little he knows about the real world. Back to the Enron case. And the authors I'm uh, quoting here from the article is Kenneth Lay, a criminal by William Anderson and Candace Jackson, which appeared on the Ludwig von Mises Institute website, and I forgot to use the break to put it up on my Radio Links page, but I swear I'll do it the next one. I swear, I swear, I promise, this time I'll really do it. All right, quote, Kenneth Lay is a political prisoner. To put it another way, the charges against him are political, not criminal in nature. He was in charge of a company that had a spectacular fall, which is not a surprise, given that Enron was riding the crest of a speculative bubble that almost certainly was going to burst eventually. It's too bad that Lay, a Ph.D. economist, did not have training in the Austrian business cycle theory, as he might have recognized the unstable conditions of the boom conditions that mistakenly were called the new economy. Indictments are written for maximum effect and lays is no exception. One is reminded of the indictment against Michael Milken, which began with the statement that Milken earned $550 million in 1987, which the government held out as de facto proof that Milken was guilty as charged. After all, no one could make that much money, honestly. Yet after one slog through the 65 pages or so, another ploy by the government to imply guilt, the longer the document, the more guilty someone must be, the 65 pages or so in the federal indictment, one is struck by the lack of criminality. The most damning charges about Lay stem from stock sales he made after it became, became clear that Enron was headed for trouble. Yet his behavior during this whole episode does not square with the criminality that the government is alleging. For the most part, Lay held the bulk of his investments in Enron stock. When some of his financial advisors told him to diversify, he insisted on borrowing against his Enron stock to purchase other securities. In other words, not sell some of his Enron stock, but borrow against it in order to diversify. However, at times he received margin calls, which means that the borrower must produce cash immediately. The only thing he could sell quickly was his Enron stock, but then he also continued to purchase that stock even in the face of company problems. At the same time, he urged employees to purchase the stock, as he was doing. These matters are public record, yet news accounts have made statements like, quote, he was quietly dumping his Enron stock at the same time he was urging employees to buy more, end quote, which says more about the integrity of U.S. mainstream journalists than it does lay stock sales. Even a cursory glance at the record demonstrates that reality is not what the government is claiming. But then neither the government nor mainstream journalists are bound by truth. Nothing should get in the way of a good story or a politically popular indictment. A more problematic situation involves testimony that Andrew Fasto will give against Lay as part of his own plea bargain agreement, in which Fasto will allege that Lay was the mastermind behind the various schemes in which Enron officials tried to hide the company's losses. There is good reason, however, however, to doubt much of the veracity of what Fasto will testify, given the circumstances of his plea agreement. In order to get Fasto to roll, the government indicted his wife, Leah, for things not related to the Enron problem, something that ordinarily she might have been able to fight in court. Now, that's a very interesting point. The same thing happened to Michael Milken. Milken resisted. He refused to roll until the federal prosecutors, in, uh, that was Rudolph Giuliani, incidentally, indicted Milken's brother, who worked for Milken and was n not nearly the brain that Milken was. And when he re Michael Milken realized that there was nothing he could do to stop them from crushing his brother, then Milken agreed to a plea bargain. Uh, going on here about the indictment against the Fastos. The Fastos have two young children, and prosecutors told them that if convicted, the youngsters would grow up without parents. No, U.S. attorneys did not use the thumbscrew or the rack, but they employed torture, torture all the same. Given the duress under which Fasto and his wife made their plea agreements, she is in federal lockup for one year, a place reserved for violent criminals. He will serve 10 years. It is doubtful that his testimony will be truthful. 
Uh, they go on to point out why the Bush administration jumped on this and why Bush enjoyed in his speeches talking about corporate executives who were cooking the books. My God, <laughs> that's uh, not the pot calling the kettle black. It's the coal mine calling the kettle black. And further on in the article, the authors say, the high-profile business collapses also have enabled the government to further criminalize what in many circumstances would have been acceptable business behavior. When combined with the Patriot Act, which ratchets up laws against money laundering and gives government regulators and prosecutors easy access to whosoever accounting books they wish to examine, the government has been able to grab enormous new powers, and the increase in white-collar criminal charges has proceeded accordingly. It's doubtful that Lay is guilty of criminal activity, especially in the sales of Enron stock. However, as the chairman of the firm, he had fiduciary responsibilities to the firm and stockholders. How, moreover, many of the decisions he made, in good faith or not, resulted in huge business losses for investors, not to mention employees who purchased large blocks of Enron stock. These matters are better suited for civil, not criminal court. Historically, this has been the venue where issues like this were argued, and at least to a point, resolved. By muscling into this legal realm, U.S. attorneys not only are criminalizing acts that are not traditionally criminal, but they also ensure that the people who should be receiving real justice are left out. And on and on we go. Now, it's interesting that in today's New York Times, there is a review of a new documentary movie that is making the rounds of some movie houses. The movie is called Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. It's a new documentary um, that is all about the rise and fall of Enron. And it says that anyone who might be in the jury pool for the coming trial of Kenneth Lay and Jeffrey Skilling uh, should not watch this because the movie makes the case against those men with prosecute, prosecutorial vigor. It's based on the best-selling book by the Fortune magazine reporters Bethany McLean and Peter Elkine. And the reviewer says that Enron, the movie Enron is a tight, fascinating chronicle of arrogance and greed. Interweaving Peter Coyote, you know, the actor, Peter, with a very distinct, distinctive voice. Peter Coyote's sober, ever so slightly sarcastic voiceover narration with interviews and video clips, as well as one ill-advised and un unnecessary reenactment. And accompanied by an anthology of well-chosen pop songs, it manages to be both informative and entertaining. Now, it's interesting that this is based on a book by Fortune uh, reporters. It is interesting that we know that there is some bias, that there is some... Uh, ignorance of reporters regarding foreign affairs, regarding uh, big government and things of this sort in the general press, which you may not realize if you haven't been in the position I have where I could compare um, financial writers with reality, is that the same kind of ignorance and bias exists just as much among financial writers for the Wall Street Journal, for Fortune Magazine, for Forbes, uh, on CNBC and these other financial shows on television. There is the same kind of ignorance uh, displayed. And these people especially love to bring down the high and mighty like Michael Milken, uh, Kenneth Lay, and others that have been uh, taken on by uh, the prosecutors in recent years. And a very interesting point is made by the reviewer in this New York Times article when he says, quote, much of the entertainment value comes from the undeniable pleasure of feeling morally superior to many of the people on screen, a nice antidote to the envy they might have inspired when they were writing high. Uh, that sense of moral superiority, I think, is the reason that people automatically like to take the side of the prosecutors and believe that these other people in the corporate world were doing us dirt. People who might readily jump to the defense of somebody who's on trial for some real criminal offense, just feeling that maybe that person is being steamrollered by prosecutors and that there could be corruption in the police department and the district attorney's office and that some innocent people are being railroaded and so forth, will, on the other hand, automatically assume that corporate rich powerful corporate executives have certainly committed the crimes of which they're being accused. And as they say here, it's an undeniable pleasure of seeing, feeling morally superior to many of the people on the screen. Not just anybody on the screen, but people who are much richer and much more successful. And that is one reason that these corporate scandals have had so much support by the public. And uh, Chris in uh, cyberspace... Minnesota, as he says, no, not cyberspace, cyberspace Minnesota, cyberspace Michigan. Send me a long email, and I'm afraid I don't have time to go into it now because we're almost out of time. But he did say one thing that uh, I neglected to bring up when talking about whether or not the Transportation Security Agency has really made us safer than before. Chris says, I heard on the news that a survey showed that government-run screening at the airport for weapons and such was found to have done a very lousy job as compared to privately hired security firms. Should be, we be surprised when you think of the government's track record? Yeah, that's an important point. I saw that also, that all the evaluations have been very, very negative. And, of course, 
what people want in government is that they institute even more oppressive security procedures at the airport. And during the campaign when Kerry was complaining about what Bush was doing, of course, what Kerry was saying was Bush wasn't doing enough, that they should be having tighter examinations on cargo coming into the country and all of this sort of thing. But the fact of the matter is that they're not doing a very good job, despite the inconvenience that they're creating. And this is not surprising at all. Every time they go to fix a problem, the guilty manage to slip through the net, even as the innocent are inconvenienced, uh, made to pay enormous costs, and it's like the old Lil Abner character, the comic strip within a comic strip, Fearless Fosdick, chasing the bad guys. Fearless Fosdick was a police detective, and he would shoot some burglar, and the bullet would go through the burglar's head and kill somebody else, some innocent person on the other side. The only difference is that the government never seems to nab the burglar, even as it's hurting the innocent bystander. So I don't really think that we should feel very secure at all that the government is protecting us. There is only one way in the world this country will become safe again, and that is to get our government out of all these foreign adventures. Well, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. My theme has been that force doesn't work, and if you can think of something during the week where you believe force has worked well, then please let me know next weekend, and we'll take it up. But we'll be talking about other things as well, I'm sure. But do have a good week. Do something nice for yourself and your family, as I keep urging you to do, and I wish you'd get to it. This is Harry Brown. Good night.